Um, I work in a region in the former Yugoslavia, as has been noted by Marilyn. We're, we're based in Sarajevo, even though we work globally. But most of our work has been centered in the Western Balkans, uh, where 40,000 people went missing as a consequence of violations of human rights and armed conflict. I'm happy to report today that of the 40,000 people that originally went missing, 70% have been accounted for, okay? So we've tried to understand what were the underlying principles that allowed these states in the Western Balkans to account for such a large number of missing persons. What happened once they exhibited the political will to find these people, and what were the factors that went into it? And we've come up with a set of what we think are best practice principles regarding what states should do. And again, this is not a scientific presentation. Yesterday, we talked about an integrated modern forensic approach to conducting these investigations. But you cannot apply science like this, or a DNA, or forensic anthropology. You can't just skip out to a mass grave site and have an anthropologist from somewhere else in the world just enter your country and start digging up mass grave sites. You have to have the political will to do so. Um, so what, what are the best practice principles, or how do states create, let's say, the political legal infrastructure that allows a scientific process to take place? Um, and that's been of great concern to us in places where we work. You have to build institutions, create legislation. So for us, these principles that are elucidated here um, form the basis of what we believe to be best practice principles. And what we've recently asked the governments within the Western Balkans to sign on to as a declaration where they would not only state that these are best practice principles, but commit to holding on to these things um, and to continuing their efforts to find missing persons. And we would welcome other governments to adhere to these principles. In creating domestic legislation, uh, there's not much out there on the international level. There is a convention on the protection of persons from enforced and involuntary disappearances. That convention uh, has now been ratified by 21 states and is in force, but it's in force or, or it's in force in the world, but it's really binding for, for the 21 states who are now signatories to the convention. But what about the 170 states, including the United States, <laughs> who are not signatories to the convention, convention on the protection of, of, of persons from involuntary and enforced disappearance? What are the rules? How do, how do states deal with this issue? And what are the rights of victims in circumstances where the convention does not apply, which is most of the world? So assisting states in creating domestic legislation that allows them to have these rights is incredibly important. So we see this as a primary best practice principle to set the stage for beginning a process of working with a state uh, to create legislation that allows uh, families of the missing the right to truth, the right to information regarding a missing person. Uh, families of the missing want to know what the circumstances were of their, their disappearances. In countries without such domestic legislation, they don't have these rights. Furthermore, this type of model legislation can also establish rule of law institutions, which as I said earlier, and I'll get into, are important, are an important manifestation of exhibiting a government's political will to address these issues. Creating central archives, and I'll get into that also later, are important so that governments can provide accurate and reliable information to their citizens regarding the number of persons who disappeared and the circumstances of their disappearances. This protection of mass graves and clandestine graves, this concept actually came from Iraq, um, where in working in Iraq, they developed a law on their own to protect mass grave sites. Following the, the, the fall of Saddam Hussein, families of the missing were desperate to find the 250 to a million people that were missing, not only from the regime of Saddam Hussein, but the war with Iran and the Gulf War. And they were desperate to find them. They ran out to mass grave sites and just pull, began pulling out bodies from mass grave sites, not knowing who they were. Um, so Iraq came up with this law to protect these mass grave sites so that families of the missing could have the correct body returned to them, number one, and number two, allowing families of the missing um, also to have the right to justice so that these mass grave sites could be properly excavated and recorded uh, so eventually they could also have the right to justice. Also, this type of legislation can also include a provision to protect uh, confidential information or genetic information in cases where DNA is used 
in many of these countries, war-torn countries um, and traditional societies, there are no laws that protect genetic information or personal information. So including that element within a particular, particular law becomes important and it protects also the victim who may be interested in providing their information and including their genetic information to search for the missing <clears throat> loved one. Ensuring access to information. Families want to know what happened. So having within this law, again, a provision that allows them to know, to carry that information, to have access to that information is also important. And then finally, and this is also critical because the whole process, this process is not just a forensic process uh, about finding people. This is about commemorating those who went missing. And this is often difficult in war-torn countries where there has been inter-ethnic strife or political strife of any sort. It's very difficult for states to take that political risk of commemorating all who went missing, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or national origin, or regardless of their position within a political party, that they are human beings, that they all deserve to be honored and commemorated. So this type of legislation is important to them. And here I have to also acknowledge ICRC, where we worked very closely together in the creation of legislation, both in Kosovo and in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And I think these are the, the types of things, and we would agree, that form best practice when a state begins to take responsibility for addressing missing persons cases. Establishing this type of legislation is important not only for the state, but for the rights of victims. Now, rule of law institutions. This becomes difficult. And again, Dan noted that in many countries, there are multiple ministries that deal with this issue. In Iraq, for example, there are five ministries that are currently dealing with the issue of missing persons. So add to the complication the fact that 250 to a million people are missing. Add to that complication the fact that five ministries within a very big country are tasked with searching for these missing persons. Um, it's chaos. So ensuring that the state takes responsibility and creates some mechanism at a high level uh, that, again, is emblematic of the state's ability to show to its citizens that it wants to take responsibility is incredibly important. I should also go, b go back to the law for a moment here. Um, uh, in creating the law on missing persons in Bosnia-Herzegovina, it was not just the legislation itself that was important. It was the manner in which this legislation was, was created. Uh, it was the Ministry for Human Rights in Bosnia-Herzegovina that took the lead in creating this legislation, but they invited victims groups, many of them from traditional societies, many of them women from rural areas, to come and participate in the creation of this legislation. They may not have been lawyers, they didn't have the background, but in inviting these victim groups to participate in the creation of their own legislation gave them a voice and allowed for trust building to, uh, to be created between a state that had previously abused them and now bringing in the families to be able to discuss the creation of their own legislation. So this is very powerful. Uh, so having a place within the rule of law institution that is eventually created for the victims is also important. They need to be a part of this process. It can't just be the state dictating the terms. The families of the missing have the right to be engaged not only in the creation of their own legislation, but in the rule of law institutions are, that are created. This also allows for transparency and accountability. Again, factors that are missing uh, during uh, abusive regimes where there is no transparency, there is no accountability. Uh, uh, Gaddafi did what he wanted to do. In a new environment now, in a new government, uh, allow families a space to enter into this process and to participate in these rule of law institutions. It's also important not only because a variety of ministries are engaged in this process, but managing large numbers of persons missing, not only from Iraq, but from other places in the world, is a complicated process that involves courts, that involves prosecutors. So having some kind of central authority that can manage and coordinate that process within a state and that can house the information and data that is found is also important. Central records and databases. This sounds so banal, but it is critical. Uh, in cases, again, where violations of human rights have occurred, it's often not in the interest of new governments, uh, many of which may still contain uh, politicians who were perpetrators from the previous regime who don't want to provide information regarding the exact number of persons missing, or they don't want to provide information regarding who went missing and the circumstances of who went missing. So breaking through that and ensuring that the state provides 
real information, accurate and reliable information to its own citizens regarding the number of persons who went missing, the circumstances under which they went missing, is part of the beginning of a state taking responsibility. In many cases following conflict, people don't know the numbers of missing persons. That's always our first question when we arrive in any other, in any context. How many people are missing? I mean, can you please give us the total? Um, it's very unknown. Ooh, I have five minutes, okay. <laughs> I had more time. Um, hold on, let me go back here. Uh, I spoke about the, the engagement of victims groups, and I just want to emphasize uh, that when dealing with them and dealing with genetic information, um, their informed consent is critical. Also, prosecutions are critical to expediting the process of searching for missing persons. Families not only want to know the fate of a missing person and to, to know their identity, but they want justice. Uh, in the former Yugoslavia, um, now we had town hall meetings recently with 70% of the persons accounted for. The narrative changed over time. They not only wanted identifications, today they want justice. Accurate identifications I spoke about yesterday, proper excavations, I hope you all, were all here, we spoke about yesterday. Um, and having universal commemorations is again important. Again, it's not just about finding people, it's about commemorating them. And August 30th, Oh, now they're asking me to take my time. All right. Um, I should go back and say that August 30th now, I'm very happy to say, um, is a day that is recognized uh, and came from Argentina, is now recognized by the United Nations as the day of disappearances for all persons who went missing. So we're trying to encourage states not only to take the responsibility to locate, recover, and identify persons missing from armed conflicts and violations of human rights, but to commemorate them, again, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or national origin, their conduct in the war, their political party affiliation, to honor all of them, and that is part of building a state. So on that note, very quickly, I conclude. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. I think we've had uh, this morning a remarkable survey of the international landscape in forensic science. Uh, diverse issues were addressed, but it's been quite a look, and I, I hope you all will join me in thanking everyone on the stage for putting this together.